Thanks, Jason. Hello, hello, hello. How are we? Good, good, good. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, this is my third time to this church, and I've got to say this church is special to us. Jen and I, my wife and I, were in the United Kingdom for 29 years planting churches. I think we planted... I don't know, like 16s churches, something like that. We just worked like dogs. And then uh, we, we came over on a storm back to Australia. And, uh, and then uh, Mark and Nina picked us up on the beach and, uh, and lifted us up and uh, wrapped their arms around us, cared for us, loved us. Uh, and, uh, and this is the third time I've preached at an emerged church. That's how good uh, Nina and Mark are. So thank you so much for having me. I, I'm very much privileged uh, to be here. Let me say something about Rachel. Where's Rachel who was singing uh, just here? Uh, let me, where's Rachel? Is she around? Rachel, hi Rachel. Everyone say hi Rachel. Uh, let me just say this, Rachel, that some people, you know the Asbury Revival is going on, right? I think it's brilliant, right? I think they've stopped it now, right? Because the queues were like 10 miles long and everyone needed to get back to their studies. But some people are presence people, some people are breakthrough people. Some people are, are spirit people, some people are word people. Some people are Joel people, I'll pour my spirit upon all flesh. Some people are Isaiah people, my word won't return void, but will accomplish for which is said. And I'll just, this is a, a, a very subtle word for you, that you're both a spirit person and a word person. And I say that because you're both a presence person and a breakthrough person. And I say this about breakthrough, that I rarely feel the presence of God when I'm in breakthrough mode. And I think sometimes in Christendom, we think we ought to be feeling God's presence, you know, and feeling God's power and, and buzzing with this, this the sense of the peace of God. It rarely happens to me. If I'm in breakthrough mode, I'm in breakthrough mode, and I'm using the Word of God to actually break through. But I feel nothing. If anything, I feel numb, or I feel like I've got a whole bunch of enemies that hate me. And so, you know, it's, it, I'm not gauging my feelings, but there are, there are times after breakthrough that presence comes. Uh, sometimes presence comes before breakthrough, but breakthrough comes before presence. But I just say to you, Rachel, and I say to you, congregation, that if you're a word person, get the word of God out and use it like a sword. If, you, if your gift is breakthrough, then if there's a time to break through, this is the time to break through. But if your gift is presence, bring the presence of God and let the presence of God settle because mountains melt like wax in the presence of God. And Rachel, you're both. And so just be strong with your left arm, be strong with your right arm, and you're an absolute champion in this generation. In Jesus' name, can you say, Amen. Oh, I've got to talk fast because, because, because I haven't got that long, right? But uh, if, if, you, if you ask me what triggered, what, a couple of things triggered me about my time in England, right? And it's my own idiocy that triggers me because I had this idea, I had this, you know people say that, that your attitude determines your altitude. And, uh, and I think Henry Ford said, he said, if you think you can or if you think you can't, he said, you're both right. In other words, if you think you can about a thing, possibly you can, right? But if you think you can't, if you think you can't about a thing, then, then you absolutely can't. And if I was, to, if I was to, to, to melt everything I'm about to say down, it's, this is it. You don't need more faith, you need less doubt. And I'm saying it to a church because the church, everyone thinks, oh, I need more faith on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. You don't need more. How much faith do you need? You're not trying to change Mars and Earth. You, you, God, God's spoken to you time and time. Every time God speaks to you, faith enters into your life. You don't need more faith. You just need less doubt. It's, and let me, the second catchphrase, just to summarize, if you go to sleep in 10 minutes, just to summarize everything I'm about to say, it's, 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 it's not what you believe, that, it's not just what you believe that counts. It's what you think about what you believe. And it's Mark 11, 22 to 24. Jesus said, if you believe and don't doubt, you can speak to the mountain, be lifted up and thrown in. Anyway, so I thought, gosh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to prove that attitude uh, creates altitude. So I thought, I'd, this is 10, 15 years ago, right? It's politically incorrect, right? So I dressed up as a beggar. I thought, I'm going to take a little film crew uh, from Sheffield in the center of England to London, and I'm going, to, I'm going to film me as a beggar to see how much money beggars make on the streets of London, right? On PC, right? Uh, it was on PC back then, right? But I did it anyway, right? And, uh, and then, then I thought, well, I'll, do, I'll also then get changed into a super cheeky charity worker wearing a Hawaiian shirt, find out how much they make, you know, with the shake of things, right? And then I'll, then I'll, then I'll dress up like I'm looking like a, million, a millionaire and I'll ask people if they can help me raise a million for charity, right? So anyway, I'm in Covent Gardens, you know, London. I'm in Covent Gardens. I'm dressed up as a beggar. I've got a sign saying, I need, uh, I need money. And then I, I was making a little bit of money. Then after 
45 minutes, two black shoes uh, came toward me, right? And, and these words still, they still trigger me today. They said, you've got the right to remain silent. They said, anything you say could be used against you in the court of law. They said, we're arresting you. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm doing some filming. And they said, where's your film crew? Everyone in the film crew had racked off into the crowd. There was... <laughs> There wasn't one, but I was the only person left, right? And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they put me in the back of a paddy wagon in London. I, I, gosh, I've never been in trouble with the law before. And, uh, and then they took me to Charing Cross Police Station. They put me in a cell, in a prison cell, for five hours. It was the most embarrassing time of my life, having to phone up my wife saying I've been arrested. And she, she said to me, you know, I'm not too sure if begging is legal in London. And you know, most husbands to wives, in one ear, out the other ear, <laughs> she said, I told you so. And, uh, and so, and then I, and so anyway, I got out, got changed into, into a Hawaiian shirt and got a shake and was raising money uh, for a charity in the south of England, right? Just, just for a little bit of time. And then I got changed and I went to Savoy Tailoring. I said, can I borrow a suit? So they said, you can borrow a suit for a week, right? And so I borrowed a boss suit for a week and I went outside the Bank of England and I was saying to people, listen, I'm trying to raise a million dollars, so would it be okay if you didn't give me less than five pounds? I mean, ten, ten, a tenner would be good, right? And uh, so, et cetera, et cetera. Here's my results, right? If I was a beggar, I did it over a year, time out for, for sick days, holiday, day, I don't know, but just time out, I'd be on a, about $30,000 a year. If I was a cheap, super cheeky charity worker, I'd be on approximately $65,000 a year. If, drum roll, that I walked out in the middle of London in a boss suit asking people to raise a million dollars, I would be on $280,000 a year. $280,000 a year. And I'm going to say this to each one of you. The Bible goes into that. Because it says, key verse, right? In Romans chapter 12, num verse number two, it says, be transformed by a renewing of your mind, thinking process, so that you can test and approve God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. It's a classic, if you're new to church, it's a classic scripture, right? Be transformed, be changed. How am I gonna get changed, right? by a change in the thinking process so that you can test and approve God's good, pleasing, perfect will. Now, here's, here's the Dave Gilpin paraphrase, right? It, to be transformed by, a renew, by changing the way you think so that you can test drive, test and approve, test drive the Maserati of God's will for your life. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. How do you get to experience the perfect will of God for your life? I'm glad that you were wondering this morning. You get to experience it by being transformed, being changed from the inside out by a change in the thinking process. Now, if you understand this, right, the Roman, the Roman road is the Roman road of faith. It bangs on about faith. In Romans chapter one, verse 17, it says the just to live by faith. It's a, it's a residential home, it's not a hotel. Faith's the currency of heaven. You can't do without it. Heaven doesn't trade in dollars, doesn't trade in yen, doesn't trade in pounds. It trades in faith. And so Romans is big on faith. It says in Romans chapter five, verse number two, it says that by faith we enter into the grace of God. So faith's a vault, faith's a treasury. It's not just something that falls upon us. It's not just something that everybody is entwined with heaven, receiving and giving to heaven. It's a treasury. It's, it's the Bank of England. It contains the treasures of heaven. How do we enter into it? We enter into it by faith. And then Romans chapter four, verse number 21, says that Abraham was fully persuaded that what God had promised he was able to perform. It pangs on. It says in Romans chapter 10, verse number 17, that faith comes by hearing from God. And then... Changes tack. And it says in Romans 12, verse number two, it's not just what you believe that counts. It's what you think about what you believe. And it's because your mind is the connector between your inner world and your outer world. And every 
every seed of faith needs a step of faith in order for God to come out of the fourth dimension into the third dimension. For God to move, he needs a seed of faith and he needs a step of faith. But how do you step out in faith unless God renews the way you think? That's why you don't need more faith. You need less doubt. What's doubt? An oscillation between what God says and what fear says. And so many of us spent our lives oscillating between what Scripture says and what Satan says. We're oscillating between the two. It's not necessarily fear-driven. It's procrastination-driven. And if you could reduce doubt, then you don't need more faith. How much faith do you need? It's just one seed for one mountain. You can't have bigger faith. You don't need a bigger seed. You don't need, you don't, you know, if faith was anything, it'd be a six-year-old and that never wears long trousers. He never, and there's no need for steroids, never works out at a gym because it's not the power of faith, it's the key of faith, the seed of faith that unlocks the door to the treasury of heaven. That's why I never feel like I'm a man of faith and power for the hour because faith's not a power. Faith's authority. Faith's a key. And what I need to stop me from being hesitant, putting the key in the door of the treasury of heaven is I need less oscillation between what God says and what the devil says. Oh, so in 1954, right, just, just to go back to a secular example, if I may, in 1954, uh, the first person to climb uh, Mount Everest, uh, no, no, the first person to run, to beat the, the mile, to run a mile in less than four minutes was Roger Bannister. And uh, if somebody in India being chased by a tiger would have beaten it, just they didn't time it. Uh, so he's the first person timed, right? In all of history, to, to beat the four minute mile, do you know, within, within a year or two, like three or four people have beaten it. Within the next six years, 200 people had beaten it. That if you protracted to 2022, over 1,500 people had beaten the four minute mile officially. So what is that? I'll tell you what that is. It's a mental block. It's, it's I, I believe that I can run fast, but I'm, I'm, I do not believe. I believe that the four-minute barrier is an actual barrier. It's a brick wall. It's more than a speed bump until somebody broke through. And it's exactly the same with Edmund Hillary in 1953. Him and Tenzing were the first two people to climb uh, Mount Everest. Wow, because now over 6,000 people have climbed Mount Everest because I had a mental block. Let me say this, your mental revolution could catapult a revival across Brisbane. That your mental cognitive change, moving from doubt to clarity, could, could cause a significant ripple effect along in, within your family of generations and within your culture of generations. You could be the key to breakthrough to a generation. It just takes one of you to beat depression. It takes one of you to beat anxiety. It takes one of you to beat the product of abuse. One of you to beat the negativity. One of you to beat Satan's machinations. And bang! You got a hundred years of a family line that's now free from that thing. Everybody's crossing the barrier because somebody's got to be the first one to cross the barrier. That's why. For 11 chapters, the Bible says it's by faith. And the 12th chapter, hey, it's not just by faith. Let's get this right. It's by what you think about what you believe. I'll just say it again, right, just for the sake of repetition, right? You don't need more faith. Just need less doubt. Uh, here's, here's the scientific bit, right? The, the, the Romans chapter 10, verse number 17 says, the faith comes by hearing from God, right? The moment you hear from God, two things happen. Firstly, faith enters into your spirit. Spurgeon, the great preacher of the early last century of the 1800s, has said that faith's like a check, that the moment you hear from God, a love letter comes to the letterbox of your heart and within that love letter is a check of faith. It's got your name on it and it's got a destination on it and it makes you rich. 
The problem with us is we're all lottery winners. We're all check holders. You might not have moved into that new home, but you are currently an owner of that home. That's why Hebrews 11 verse one says that faith is the substance or foundation of the beginning of things hoped for. It's like a check. And some of you think, what I need is more money. No, no, you need to hold that check. What I need is a breakthrough and healing. No, 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 you don't. What you need is to hold onto the check of breakthrough and healing. It's got breakthrough of healing in it. It's just that you let go of the check. Most checks are down the, the back of the couch right now because nobody values the check of faith. They value feelings and they value immediate material breakthrough, but they don't value the winning numbers that God's given you that make the future a certainty. I'll add this for free. Faith's got nothing to do with the marriage you've got, the house you own, the car you drive. It's got nothing to do with the health of your body because faith is lassoed to an unseen tomorrow. That's why God gives you faith. When everything's going well, there's no need for faith. But God gives you faith in a dry place, but it's always associated with a world unseen. That's why the Bible says the just don't live by the future world. They live by the current grabbing hold of what is attached to the future world. And it's a check of faith. Am I preaching brilliantly or awesomely? One of the two. You can decide. <sighs> Exhausted preaching here at Emerge Church. The second thing that happens, because how do you know that you've got faith? Well, what God does within your mind is he sees a pathway through a laser beam between two parts of your mind that he previously ran like a river meanders, not as the crow flies. You knew that God loves you, but bang, you've heard from God. It's like, it's like as the crow flies, now you know that God loves you. You knew that God provided, but now God's spoken to you. Now you know. It's as the crow flies, not as a river meanders. That's, and so how do you know you're saved? Because I, I know that I know. It's a double knowing. You've got to get into this. It's a double knowing. So God's placed a pathway, with, a, a thin pathway within the mind. And he's placed a check within his spirit. And can you see he's getting ready for breakthrough here? So what do you do about the thin pathway in the mind? Well, that's, that's your business, what you do with the thin pathway in the mind. Because if you don't walk on it, it will grow over. And you might still have the checks, but they're in the bottom drawer, not in the back pocket. And so, so you make faith passive by not activating it, by, by al allowing it to, to, uh, to come up and allowing it to be used in the name of Jesus Christ. So, faith, so I've lost my, my train of mind there. I'm speeding along, right? So faith opens up a pathway. You've got to walk that pathway to widen that pathway. It's like a country track. The more people that walk on the country track, the wider it gets. You need to make it that wide that God can lay some train tracks down. Because what God wants to create within your thinking process is trains of thought. Not just individual carriages of thought, but he wants to create trains of thought. Because each train carries building material to potential skyscrapers of habit within the mind. Let me backtrack one sentence and say this, that inside your mind are fields of dreams. Inside your mind are floods of emotion. Inside your mind are trains of thought. And inside your mind are cities of habit. Catchphrase, the skyline of your mind will determine the skyline of your future. You can't create your future like Anthony Robbins says, but you can miss out on the future that God already has for you. Our aim is to pull down the skyscrapers in the fallen mind and grow skyscrapers in the new mind. If you become a new creation through being born again by the Spirit of God, you are a brand new creation. The old is gone on the inside, but within your mind, you've now received virgin territory. It's marked out for construction. So the job now comes for us to construct cities of habit within the new part of the mind. 
I would say that the nine fruits of the Spirit are nine strongholds that God wants to create within our mind. He wants to build the city of peace. He wants to build the city, metropolis of love, the city of goodness, the city of faithfulness, the city of self-control, etc. He wants to grow them within your mind because God knows that the silhouette of your mind will become the silhouette of your future. How do I know that? Because it's not just what you believe that counts. It's what you think about what you believe that counts. And the most dominant skyscraper within your mind leads the way. There are times we work on our will. It's like a diet. People can drop 10 kilograms while they're super working on it. The moment they stop working on it, it comes back to the cities of habit. Unless you work on destroying and pulling down strongholds within the mind and growing new strongholds of the mind, you'll remain identical. And that's why God is very interested in the way you think because God doesn't want you to be a one-hit wonder. He doesn't want you to be like the Baha men who let the dogs out or Natasha, 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 you know that, that I'm torn, lying naked on the floor. Just God doesn't want you to be a one-hit wonder. He wants you to be like a Chris Martin. He wants you to have a yellow, have the scientist. He wants you to, to have a Viva La Vida. He wants you to, to go on and have a, a sky full of stars. He wants you to be a legend of the kingdom of God, not a one-hit wonder in the kingdom of God. So he can't just give you breakthrough. He's got to change the way you think. We ran a recovery house for women with life-controlling issues in England that finished by being a recovery house for people coming out from uh, sex trafficking and coming out from human slavery. Eventually, we had 170 staff that were working. We rescued and housed over 600 women, uh, survivors of human trafficking. And behind that, we did outreach to 3,000 survivors of human trafficking through our outreach programs. But... People would say to me with women with life-controlling issues, just get them together and just deliver them. Well, fair enough, right? Because the power of God's in us to deliver people of demons and deliver people of oppression, right? The problem is that within a month, they'd probably be exactly the same as they were, maybe slightly worse because I raised their expectation. What God wants to do is, is God wants to restore and strengthen the will within people because their will has been steamrolled to the point of having a weak will. God wants to re-strengthen the will within their lives. And so if there are a house and there's squatters in the house, the first thing God wants to do is replace the windows of vision. The moment the windows are replaced and broken to whole, three squatters leave. He then wants to, to, to rip up the old carpet of condemnation throughout the house. The moment that carpet comes up, another three squatters leave. He wants, to, he wants to, to take out the dry rot of victimhood. The moment the dry rot's gone, another two squatters leave. And then he wants us to fix up the front door of decision making. The moment we fix the front door up, every squatter's gone. And we've created victory that's irreversible. That's why God spends a little longer on breakthrough than you want him to spend. Because he wants you to be legendary. He wants you to be a part of Coldplay, not the Baha men. He wants you to become a legend for the kingdom of God. Uh, let me, let me, let me, I've drawn a map. It's available afterwards in my resources. I'll show you in a second. But in the old part of your mind, there's three regions, right? I would say the northern region in the old part of your mind is what I call the royal cities. Self-centeredness, self-pity, self-justification, all the self. They're the royal cities. They're the, they're the most evil cities within us because we end up worshipping ourselves instead of worshiping God. That's the problem with modern psychology. It says today, put yourself first. Jesus says, deny yourself, pick up your cross daily. Jesus said, if you gain the whole world, you'll lose your soul. We are at war against modern psychology that puts a ring around yourself and says, you've got to love yourself before you can love others. May I suggest, unless you love others, You'll, you'll rarely get to love yourself. The second lot of cities are what I call the industrial cities. These are the moody cow cities. These are the cities of attitude, the, the city of hatred, the city of sulkiness, the city of resentment, all of the moody cities that lie dormant. And we say, this is just who I am. I'm, I'm a moody cow. It's not. 
they're the toxins that come from the industrial cities and the fallen part of your mind. And then the third lot of cities is what I call the historic cities, but these are the classic cities like stealing, like lying, like lust, like uh, second life feel, just they're, they're what we notoriously call sin within our lives. But you've got to realize the sin of pride is a million times worse than the sin of porn. And the sin of porn is a bad, destructive sin. But the sin of pride is where every other sin enters into. And so what we need to do, because every thought comes into Grand Central Station of the will. That's what God wants to strengthen in you. So you don't say, it just happened, just happened, just happened. I just couldn't stop it. Couldn't st-. No, you could. You could. So every thought comes into grand state stage of the will, right? Let me tell you how it happens, right? Just say you're not, you're not invited to the barbecue this Sunday, right? And uh, I might be a word of knowledge for you. And uh, so you're thinking, gosh, okay, um, I'm not invited to the barbecue. This is a thought coming into Grand Central Station. It's always accompanied, an observational thought is always accompanied by a perceptive thought. And the perceptive thought is, is why wow, your world's falling apart. Because you weren't invited last month. Because you text that person, it took them three and a half days to text you back with okay. So your perceptive thought is, is filled with insecurities, but, but they're not insecurities, it's a part of your human nature. And so both the observational thought and the perceptive thought, and the perceptive thought thinks this might be a change of season. But they both enter into the grand central stage of the will. The platform station master on the fallen platforms is Satan. And he says to you, he says, it's because nobody has ever liked you. It's because from birth, you've only had friends for a short period of time until they actually get to know you. And the truth is, you're not funny enough, you're not intelligent enough, you're not clever enough, and you're not social enough. So he's playing upon a pattern of thinking that you've had now for 35 years. So he goes, train leaving right now, it's leading to Rejectionville. Toot, toot. (laughs) Short rail trip to Inferioryville. A short flight to the city of self-pity. Every time you catch that train, you bring building material to make Rejection City even taller. This is what to do, right? On the other side of the platform, call it the eastern side of the platform. If Satan's on the western side of the platform, the Holy Spirit's on the eastern side of the platform. And the Bible says whenever you're tempted, God provides a way of escape. There's no such a thing in the temptations that you've been tempted with for the last two weeks that a bird hasn't sung, that there hasn't been a noise to remind you that there's a way out of this temptation. And so the way out is through the Word of God. So arriving at the eastern platform is the Psalm 23 train. And it says, hey, the Lord's your shepherd. It's not your friends. It's God. Toot, toot. Train leaving to the city of peace right now. Now, if you miss that train, God's generous with you. And a second train arrives might be slightly ubiquitous to some of you in this room, but it's the Hebrews chapter 10 verse 9 train that says that God will take away the first to establish the second. So the only reason why God clears you of old friends is because he's got a bag full of new friends. Your old friends took you from A to B, your new friends will take you from B to C. Your old friends took you from the middle of the lake to the side of the lake, the new friends will take you from the side of the lake to the top of the mountain. That's why God changes friendships through mid-story. Because the problem with survivors, they see you as a struggler and a survivor instead of seeing you as a victor. So God's got to change your friendships. So that's, that's that train all aboard. It's, it's leaving right now to faithfulness town. And then if you miss that, there's always the Philippians 1, 6 train that, that, that says that, that God is faithful to, to, to what's his, what does it say? That God is faithful to, that God's faithful that he'll finish Everything is started. It's the anti-panic train. So saying all aboard now, the anti-panic train, hop on board. This is the train to kill anxiety. The God is faithful and just to fulfill every promise that he has upon your life. Now, let me say this right, because I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, 
I'm going to uh, land it in a second. Let me say this, right? That every train you catch takes building material to the cities they're destined to. And your aim is to build the cities in the new part of your mind and destroy the cities in the old part of your mind. Uh Uh-huh. The skyline of your mind will determine the skyline of your future. Can, Can you see what I'm, I'm a faith guy, but I realize I need to be a faith and thoughtful guy. I can't just be a faith guy, otherwise I'll be, I'll be a Natalie Umbruglia, you know, a one-hit wonder. But I don't wanna be. I wanna be a legend in the land. So I've gotta have this changed in order to renew my character so that this sustainable development happens within me and the future. I wanna be a sustainable person. When breakthrough happens, I don't wanna be two steps forward, three steps back. I wanna be two steps forward, stand still and watch the salvation of God. Two steps forward, stand still and watch the salvation of God. That's what I wanna do. That's what happens through character and through transformed development within the mind. It's good, isn't it? Glad you came. Uh Uh-huh, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna give you uh, like, like three or four uh, ways which you can strengthen, uh, you can uh, strengthen the Grand Central Station of your will. Three or four ways you can strengthen Grand Central Station of the will. The first way is you wanna know, you, number one, you wanna know what you want, what you really, really want. No, I know I've taken that from, from, from the Spice Girls, but, but it, it's a brilliant line. Because the problem with temptation is, oh, I want it. But you don't really, really want it. It's, it's like you say I'm an idiot, but you don't really, really believe you're an idiot. So why are you saying you're an idiot? You want, it, you want to go for what you really, really want and say who you really, really are and stop, stop saying who you're not and going for what you don't really, really want. There's a six-year-old, had a frog jumped up on his shoulder and he was walking home from school and the frog said, if you kiss me, I'll turn into a beautiful princess. And the, frog, the, the six-year-old just grabs the frog, puts it in his back pocket and the frog squeezes out and says, hey, I, I told you, he, he jumped on his shoulder and said, if you kiss me, I'll turn into a beautiful princess. And the kid just looked at the frog, the frog looked at him and he grabbed the frog, put it back in his back pocket. Now this makes frogs very angry. And so now it's a mad frog, right? Turned from green to red, right? And it's come out, jumped on his shoulder and said, hey kid, I said to you that if you kiss me, I'll turn into a beautiful princess. Why won't you kiss me? And the boy boy says, oh, it's easy. He says, I I don't actually want a beautiful princess. What I want is a talking frog. You know, there's five levels of emotions in you. Just, just follow me through on this. It's a little complicated, but I, I put V words for each one to make it simple for you. The, the most shallowest level of, of emotion within you is, is, or is a bad hair day, visiting emotions. Right? Everyone's, some of you got a bad hair day going on right now, but you're here, aren't you? You've, <laughs> it's just, it's, just so, it's like a fly in the room, right? You can still work with a fly in the room. It's just slightly annoying, right? So the second level is volatile emotions. These volatile emotions are like resentment. They are like, like, like um, deep frustration, deep depression, high anxiety, and high anger. But let me say this about anger. 90% of all of your anger comes from disappointment. Most of our Christian life is just dealing with anger problems instead of going a little deeper into disappointment problems. And to be a Christian, to have good devotion, you've got to plumb a well right through these emotional levels. So underneath the volatile emotions are vulnerable emotions. And, and this is, am I significant? Am I really needed? Am I really wanted? Get it? They're just stuff that God wants to really answer to you in your devotional life with him. Saying, yeah, you are, you're not important, but you're significant. Everything you do will be rewarded by heaven. Just all the stuff God talks about in order to, to, to strengthen your vulnerability. 
But that's not the deepest emotion within you. If we go down to the fourth emotion, it's your visionary emotions. And visionary emotions is what every athlete uses. They will walk and run through pain in order to win gold at the next Olympics. And what God wants to do within you is to project your vision from just in front of you and project it to what's over the mountain so that you can see the victory that Christ has for you if you do not give up. Visionary emotions change everything. That's why God wants to bring you back to purpose. He wants to bring you back to why the hell are you alive? Why are you living? Because the moment you answer that, your vision becomes long range and tell how to get someone who's depressed, more depressed, go more and more microscopic. If you're like me and I'm, I'm an overthinker, there has to become a time where I say shut up, but I can't just shut up because I overthink. What I've got to do is project my thinking to what's over the mountain and live with telescopic vision, not just microscopic, not just small microscopic vision. I've lost my place there just for a second. Um, so, oh, what's my first point? Just tell me my first point. I'll go to my, or my second point. First point. Yeah, you want to go what you really want. So the last one is, is our victorious emotions. When, when, when in Romans chapter 14, it says the kingdom of God is not food and drink. So, so slap you in the face for your behavior back when COVID was around. Because it's not food and drink. The, the kingdom of God is joy, peace, and righteousness. Well, for a start, leave out righteousness for a second. Two-thirds of that is emotional. So deep, 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 deep down within you, there's joy is like a river within you. So if you're gonna be really honest, really, 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 really honest with how you're feeling, I'm feeling great. Because Jesus is resurrected and the same power that rose Christ from the dead lives in me. I'm victorious, I'm a conqueror. That's the true emotion in every Christian is I'm full of peace, not even worried. I'm like a lottery winner whose numbers just came up last week. That's how good I feel. Now, can you see when someone says, how are you feeling? You're feeling five things. That's why it's up to you to go deeper and tell people not just how you're feeling on a bad hair day, but how you're feeling in your visionary emotions and victorious emotions. You wanna know what you really, really want, not just what you want. It's a great point, that, isn't it? Okay. I've only got a few minutes, right? But my second point is that you wanna be an environmentalist. You're gonna create a hothouse environment. If you've got a problem with Krispy Kremes and you're single, don't set up in a bed set above the Krispy Kreme shop. <laughs> because at 2 a.m., you're going to think, oh, I'd like a nibble. And so you go down and the, the, the Krispy Kremes in the rubbish bins are still fresh. No, you know, they're still fresh, right? But it's your problem that you're fat. It's because you, you're in the bed set above the Krispy Kreme shop. When Jesus wanted to heal Jerry's daughter, he only brought in 25% of his disciples because the others weren't good enough. It's because he's trying to atmosphere control. He's trying to be a thermostat, not a thermometer. He's trying to be an environmentalist. Shut the door, keep out doubt. Keep out the devil, keep out the doubters. If God speaks to you something precious from God, don't tell it to the doubters. Don't cast your pearl before swine. You gotta protect yourself from doubt. You wanna build a hothouse environment of faith. Put on some worship music. Put on, come to church regularly. Have some strong devotions. But what you're doing is creating and recreating good atmospheric environmental conditions. <sighs> Number three, you wanna change your confession. The greatest faith word in the Bible is the word but because it combines reality with a higher reality. For example, uh, if I was going uh, camping in Stradbroke and uh, it was raining off and there were seven of us and I forgot all the tent poles, uh, they'd be mad at me. But if I went but, we've got seven free nights to the spa hotel up the room there. Uh, anyone want to come along, right? The, the whole atmosphere would change because everybody loves a spa hotel. And all I've done is put the word but in. That's what King David did in Psalm 31. Uh, he said, I feel like broken pottery. I feel like everyone's against me, but I put my hope in you, in the Lord I trust. 
I've got to finish, I've got to finish on this uh, point because I do have to uh, go to Morayfield, which is one of your Zooming congregations. For my resources, before I do my last point, my resources are um, grab and go. You don't have to pay for them. Well, tomorrow you do but not today. So it's just grab and go. So I've got my book, The Hit Factory. The, the catchphrase is the next you is the next big thing. Oh my God. The greatest enemy to the next you is the past you. This is it's a golden book. Here's my wife's book called Prophesy and it's 84 fire starters to a fresh devotional life. It is absolutely electric. Here's my book called The Truth Diet and there's 181 nuggets of protein to counter culture what's happening in the world today. Here's my book, Five, Think Twice, which is 500 trains of thought to news ways of thinking. And here's my, it'll come up on the screen behind me, that here's my mind map that I drew. And these are available um, afterwards as well, uh, alone. Look, that's what I've just explained to you. I haven't shown it to you during my preach because I know how distracted that you get because most of you have ADHD, right? So I've just decided to keep that there, but that's available afterwards as well. Here's my last point, and I do have to shoot. My last point is that, that victory doesn't require the uh, elimination of bad cities. Inside my mind, there's ghost towns. Cities that used to operate, but don't anymore. How come? Because I've bombed the tracks with prayer. How come? Because, because, the, because the, my, the, my prayers are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Because every train that I've been on that's in the darkened part of my mind, there's been a yellow taxi cab of kindness right next to it. It's called the kindness of God. Romans chapter four says that his kindness leads us to repentance. No one's far away from God and not even Putin. God's right next to him in a yellow taxi cab of kindness. All he needs to do and all you need to do is press the button, the red button, get off the train, get in the yellow taxi cab, you bang, you're back in the will of God. Back in the will of God. So because I'm doing, doing that, there's some towns that like the town of depression, it used to be a major, a major landmark in the fallen part of my mind. It's just, it's empty now. It's still there. But it's lost its power. When John Forbes Nash did A Beautiful Mind and he was mental, right? He had schizophrenia, had all kinds of stuff. And eventually he, he got the Nobel Peace Prize. There's a good movie on it. Um, Nobel Peace Prize for physics or something like that. And his friend of 40 years said, hey, how does it feel to be free? How does it feel to be free of all the voices within your mind? He's, he, and the camera moves back and you can see these, these uh, mysterious figures in, in, the, in the perimeter of his mind, because it's symbolizing it. He said, oh, no, 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 no. He said, the voices are still there. He said, I've just chosen to ignore them. All you need to do is turn floods of emotion back into rivers of emotion that you can control and we're winning. In our age of perfectionism, you think that deliverance means complete absence of the structure of the city. No, it means complete absence of the power of the city but not of the geography of the city it's it's a it, it, it's a strong point that because a lot of you are thinking oh it's, I pray it is still there it's still there it's still there no it's weakening it's weakening it's it definitely weakening that machination that, that that came on you when you were 13 it's been with you for 30 years yeah I do understand that but it's weakening it's weakening, it's, it's, it's part of the building on fire because you bombed it with prayer and in your time of prayer and fasting. And plus, plus the tracks aren't, not many trains get there anymore. Plus, you've been pressing that red button, getting off into the taxi cab of kindness pretty often, right? What you wanna create is ghost towns. What you wanna create is not floods, but, but rivers. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna pray for you, I'm gonna hand the meeting back, but... I'm gonna pray for you because there's people here with a lot of sensitivities within the mind. And this message, even though I've done it in a strong way, it's coming from a gentle heart, so I know what it's like to be afflicted. But then your liberty will be the liberty for a hundred years. It'll be the liberty for a generation, the liberty for a culture. 